Hello everybody, welcome to, back to Physics 425. Uh, we're here at the roadmap that we developed for understanding dilution refrigerators. And in fact, we've done a lot of the work. We've done some review of quantum mechanics so that we could distinguish between identical fermions and identical bosons. Uh, because we're dealing with uh, helium-3, it was the fermions that were particularly important for us, and so we understood some things about fermion systems, such as the low temperature heat capacity. We also now have done the low temperature entropy. And then we started talking about the, the physics of mixtures of helium-3 and helium-4. Um, and we saw a couple of things. Uh, one of the things we saw is that once you get to a sufficiently low temperature, there's a phase diagram that shows that the mixture splits into two phases, uh, a phase that's rich in helium-3 and a dilute phase that doesn't have much, has less helium-3 in it. And we talked about the chemical potentials of those two phases. So what we're going to do today is, I think, a lot of this stuff that remains, uh, we're going to talk about a little bit of the Gibbs free energy. We're actually going to start with, I think, an analogy between evaporative cooling and the cooling that we'll get at the base temperature of a dilution refrigerator. And then we may even discuss cooling power and base temperature. Okay, so let's get started. First thing we'll do is review some of the important results that we've talked about one of those results is the low temperature heat capacity of a system of fermions. And we discovered that that heat capacity was proportional to temperature and that that was also turned out to be equal to the entropy of the system. This is the what we discovered about the chemical potential. We saw that for the concentrated phase or the phase that's rich in helium-3, there was some chemical potential mu C, but actually at low concentrations, the helium-3 binds more strongly in uh, liquid helium-4, and so that led to a lower chemical potential for the dilute phase. However, as we added more and more helium-3 atoms, as we increased the concentration X, The additional helium-3 atoms had to go into higher energy states because of the Pauli exclusion principle, and that uh, caused the chemical potential of the dilute phase to rise, and eventually the two cross, and that's where we would find our equilibrium concentration. Okay, so let's start by thinking about this analogy between evaporative cooling which we talked about earlier in the course, and now a dilution refrigerator. So I want to imagine that we've made a chamber, and in this chamber, we're gonna put in a mixture of helium-3 and helium-4. On a dilution refrigerator, this is called a mixing chamber. And so we suppose that this has been pre-cooled to some low temperature, low enough that the mixture phase separates into the concentrated phase and the dilute phase, and maybe the phase boundary lies somewhere here within the chamber. And so this is the concentrated phase and if we get to sufficiently low temperatures this is almost pure liquid helium-3 and then the more dense uh, dilute phase is below and at the lowest temperatures this is maybe about 6.6% uh, helium-3 
and the rest is liquid helium-4. So we have an inlet and an outlet, and what we're going to imagine doing is we're going to inject helium-3 atoms in this inlet, and we're going to take helium-3 out at this outlet. And in equilibrium, the rate that we're injecting helium-3 and the rate that we're removing helium-3 is equal. Um, and that also means that we have helium-3 atoms crossing this phase boundary. And so we want to think about that a little bit. So here's our phase boundary. Okay. So we'll just make a couple of notes here. In equilibrium, the rate of injection equals the rate of removal. And to keep the concentration in the dilute phase fixed, Right, so if we're removing helium-3 atoms from the outlet, then we're losing helium-3 in the dilute phase, and if we want to keep that fixed, then we're going to have to take a helium-3 from the concentrated phase, from the pure liquid helium-3 above, and some of it's going to have to cross over into the dilute phase. So we require helium-3 atoms from the concentrated phase to cross the phase boundary at the same rate. And so that rate might be n dot, like a certain number of helium-3 atoms per unit time. Uh, so the same rate as the injection slash removal via the inlet and outlet. Okay, so let's just think a little bit about evaporative cooling. So recall evaporative cooling. And so in that picture, what we had was maybe a beaker of liquid. It could be, say, liquid helium-4 or something like that. And so here's a dense liquid. And above, we have a dilute vapor. And so there's these vapor atoms above and maybe we have a pump and we're pumping on that vapor and in equilibrium the rate that we are removing vapor atoms with the pump has to be equal to the rate that we're evaporating atoms from the liquid and adding them to the vapor and so if we establish this equilibrium, then the vapor is at a constant pressure. And every time we remove an atom from the liquid, it removes some heat from the liquid. And so that's the cooling that we achieve via evaporation. Okay, well, so let's just think about this. Um, if the vapor is at constant pressure, then, uh, so enthalpy H was equal to U plus PV. So if we take a differential, DH is, uh, DU is DQ minus VDP is the work. And then we have the differential of PV, which is plus V, uh, PDV plus VDP. So we get a cancellation, cancellation. And so DQ 
uh, plus VDP is left over. But we said in equilibrium, we're going to have a constant pressure. And if we have a constant pressure, DP is zero. And therefore, the change in enthalpy tells us how much heat is removed. Uh, so delta H is equal to delta Q and the latent heat of evaporation is given by the change in enthalpy or in other words it's how the enthalpy changes from the dense liquid to the dilute vapor. So what does that have to do with our dilution refrigerator? Well, the dilution refrigerator is like an upside down evaporator. Because we're taking concentrated helium-3, so this is like our liquid phase, and then inside here we have a dilute, if you like, gas of helium-3 atoms, and what we're doing is we're pumping them away, and so... Maybe this is acting like our pump. And in order to keep the pressure of our gas in the dilute phase constant, we're evaporating helium-3 atoms from the concentrated phase and adding them to the gas. And if we keep the concentration of the dilute phase fixed, that's like keeping a fixed vapor pressure. And so we're doing this at constant pressure, and how much heat we extract is determined from uh, the change in enthalpy from the concentrated phase to the dilute phase inside this mixing chamber. So our goal is going to be to calculate the change in enthalpy between these two phases in the mixing chamber. So we need... we need to calculate the enthalpies enthalpies of of the concentrated and dilute phases in the mixing chamber. Okay, if we can do that, then we could determine the rate at which we're removing heat. And so the so-called cooling power of the mixing chamber will be determined from the following. Q dot is going to be equal to N dot. And so this is going to be the molar circulation rate of helium-3. So N dot represents both the rate that we're injecting helium-3 into the concentrated phase and the rate that we're removing it from the dilute phase, but it's also more importantly the rate that helium-3 is crossing the phase boundary from the concentrated phase to the dilute phase. And then what's going to be important is the change in enthalpy, and so it's going to be the difference between the enthalpy of the dilute phase, which is the final. Uh, our helium-3 is going from the concentrated to the, to the dilute phase. So if we're calculating the 
change in enthalpy, the final enthalpy minus the initial, it's the dilute phase minus the concentrated phase. And these would be the enthalpies per mole the way that we've written it. Okay, so that's kind of the motivation for what we're going to do next, which is all about calculating enthalpies. Okay, so we'll start with the enthalpy of the... Uh, Sorry, my, how much did I lose here? Yeah, this little app that I'm using is starting to crash once in a while. So we're gonna have to calculate the enthalpy. And we'll start with the concentrated phase. Okay, so the first thing to note is our concentrated phase is pure liquid helium-3 practically. And so if the liquid helium-3 is considered to be incompressible, then a process at constant pressure will also be at constant volume. Okay, why is that important? Um, it's because for something like a gas, you can calculate a heat capacity at constant pressure and at constant volume, and they can be different. Uh, for an ideal gas, they are different. Uh, but for a liquid, an incompressible liquid, the two are approximately the, the same. And so what this means is that the heat capacity at constant pressure is approximately the same as the heat capacity at constant volume. And that's going to be important in just a second. Okay, so we already saw that um, dH is equal to dQ plus VdP. And so that for a constant pressure with dP equal to zero, then dH is just equal to dQ. Uh, well, so that means that we could calculate a heat capacity at constant pressure from the enthalpy. And so by definition, the heat capacity at constant pressure is gonna be dq dt at constant p, but we just said that dq and dh are the same for constant pressure processes. And so we can also calculate the heat capacity at constant pressure as dH dt. Um, or delta H is going to be the integral from 0 to t of the heat, of the heat capacity. So the enthalpy as a function of temperature is equal to the enthalpy at zero temperature plus this integral of the heat capacity. Well, we know that CV is gonna be equal to CP and for us, we calculated CV was the following it was linear in temperature so a bunch of constants times temperature um, KB we could write as the uh, universal gas constant divide, uh, divided by 
the Avogadro's number, and so this is equivalent to pi squared over 2, the number of moles times r over t times times t over tf, and so this little n is going to be the number of moles. Okay, and so we've used that this gas constant is Avogadro's constant times kb. Okay, and so therefore the molar specific heat so we're going to take our heat capacity and divide by the number of moles of the concentrated phase is uh, so I'm going to use C sub C for the specific heat of the concentrated phase and it's just the expression above where we divide by n Um, and so we already established that that was also equal to the entropy. So this is also going to be equal to the molar entropy. And so we have the molar specific heat. And we have the molar entropy. Okay. So experimentally, if you get to low temperatures, let's say below 40 millikelvin, the specific heat of pure liquid helium-3 is experimentally found to be It's about 24 times T, where the units are going to be uh, joules per mole per Kelvin. So T is obviously measured in Kelvin, where T is in Kelvin. I mean, so what this what this 24 is really doing is it's it's really determining the value of the Fermi temperature of the pure liquid helium-3 because all the other constants are known. Okay, well, that means that the molar enthalpy is going to be, we said it was going to be whatever it was at zero temperature plus the integral of the specific heat and of course the integral of 24 times t is just going to be 12 t squared we still don't know what the constant hc of zero out front is but it's going to turn out not to matter and we'll see that soon enough so this is the molar enthalpy of pure liquid helium-3 or of the concentrated phase inside of our dilution refrigerator, uh, inside the mixing chamber of the dilution refrigerator. Okay. Um, so what we have to do now is think about the dilute phase. And so now we need the enthalpy of the dilute phase. And so this is, you know, about 6.6% of helium-3 in liquid helium-4. Okay, so the molar specific heat is, well, the same kind of thing. It's pi squared over 2, R, T over T Fermi, where maybe T Fermi is different because 
T Fermi depends, remember, on the density, the n over v, to some power. But nevertheless, it has the same functional form. However, at a concentration of the 6.6%, oh, well, sorry, I shouldn't say however. Let's just say at a concentration of 6.6%, T Fermi is about 380 millikelvin. And so that means the molar specific heat and the molar entropy of the dilute phase is, um, if you put in the numbers, it's about 107 times T joules per mole. And so this is now per mole of helium-3. We have to be a bit careful because there's lots of uh, liquid helium-4 in the dilute phase. So now this is the molar amount of the helium-3. And so what you might be tempted to do is then just to calculate the enthalpy in the same way we did for the concentrated phase. But now this is where we have to say, however, the helium-3 is more strongly bound to the helium-4 atoms, and that, that has an effect. So due to the binding energy between the helium-3 atoms and the surrounding helium-4 in the dilute phase, the enthalpy of this phase is measured to be different than that, whoops, sorry, than that of a non-interacting Fermi system, right? If you think back to everything that we did when we were doing our quantum mechanics review and then when we were doing a calculation of the uh, heat capacity all of that assumed that we had non-interacting fermions. And so, for example, their only energy was a kinetic energy, h bar squared, k squared over 2m. And everything relied on that assumption. However, it turns out that for our dilute phase, because of the relatively strong binding between the helium-3 atoms in that phase and the surrounding helium-4, that that assumption breaks down. And so the result is that we cannot calculate the molar enthalpy of the dilute phase from the integral of the specific heat. So we need another method. And so to do that, what we're going to do is we're going to consider the Gibbs free energy. Let me remind you what that Gibbs free energy was. G was equal to enthalpy minus T times S. Uh, so the enthalpy was internal energy plus PV and so now we're going to subtract Ts from that. And then when we take the differential, we get a whole bunch of terms. So we're going to have a du plus pdv plus vdp minus Tds minus sdt. Um, and then for du, 
uh, it's dq minus pdv, but dq we could write as tds, and then we have minus pdv, uh, and remember we also said if we had a system in which the number of particles was changing, we also had a chemical work, and the chemical work was the chemical potential mu times dn. Okay, and so then we still have plus P dV minus, uh, plus V dP minus T dS minus S dT. Okay, so fortunately there are some cancellations. The T dS goes and the P dV goes. And so then what we have for the differential of our Gibbs free energy is mu dN uh, plus VDP minus SDT. So what we can do with this is we can say if we had a process at constant pressure and constant temperature, then DP and DT will be zero and we'll be left with mu is Oh, sorry, uh, dg dn provided we had constant pressure and temperature. Okay. Um, recall that for a Fermi system, At low temperature, the chemical potential was equal to the Fermi energy. So this is in the T goes to zero limit. We had this, and we actually calculated this Fermi energy. It was h bar squared over 2m, 3 pi squared, n over v to the 2 thirds. Now, all I'm going to use from this is the fact that mu is proportional to this n over v to the two-thirds. And so if we imagine that, for example, we change n, maybe we cut n in half, then we would expect, so if we take half of our, uh, we have a bucket of liquid helium-3 and we take half the atoms away, then the volume will also be cut in half and this ratio won't change. And so that means mu is independent of, say, particle number, because if we change particle number, we're also changing volume by the same amount. So if we have n, then we also have v, and therefore n over v remains constant and mu is unchanged. Okay, so let's think of this equation up here, number sign. Um, that means that if we calculated delta G uh, how would we calculate delta G? Delta G would be the integral, oh, sorry, would be equal to the integral of mu dn. But if mu is independent of n, We just get delta G is equal to mu delta N or say G final minus G initial is equal to mu uh, N final minus mu N initial so that we could identify things with F subscripts as being equal to each other and things with 
i subscripts as being equal to each other and the result that i wanted to get is that this gibbs free energy is equal to the chemical potential times n or mu is g over n okay and so that's kind of an interesting result that the gibbs free energy divided by n is the chemical potential or mu is the gibbs free energy per particle so the chemical potential is equal to the Gibbs free energy per particle. So if you ever run into it, then you kind of have a physical interpretation now for the Gibbs free energy because we know that chemical potential is this chemical work and it tells us how our system energy changes as we change particle number. Okay, so hopefully we'll be able to use this to determine the enthalpy and just to think ahead here, Gibbs free energy is enthalpy minus T times the entropy uh, or H is gonna be G plus TS. And so that's what we're gonna use. We're going to end up using that to calculate our enthalpy. Okay, so let's recall this chemical potential picture, picture that we've uh, already showed at the beginning. Chemical potential of the dilute phase versus concentration of helium-3. So it look at this, here's mu, here's zero, and this is x. This was the chemical potential of our concentrated phase and then of our dilute phase. It was something that was increasing with concentration because as we added more and more uh, fermions to the dilute phase, which helium-3 atoms, which are fermions, they go into higher and higher energy states. They increase the uh, Fermi energy. And so at equilibrium, x equilibrium, uh, mu c is equal to mu d. We would reach equilibrium because if, for example, we didn't have, if we had a lower concentration, then we would just get um, atoms from the concentrated phase from the pure liquid helium migrating into the dilute phase until that equilibrium was established. Okay, so therefore, if the chemical potentials have to be equal and the chemical potential is the Gibbs free energy per particle, then we must require that the Gibbs free energy per particle or the Gibbs free energy per mole have to be equal at equilibrium. So we require the molar Gibbs free energy, free energies of the concentrated phase and the dilute phase to be equal. So that was the purpose of showing that chemical potential was Gibbs free energy per particle. And so we have the following condition. Uh, and we just said that the enthalpy plus, uh, Gibbs free energy was enthalpy minus T S. Uh, 
Yeah, so we have this result. Um, okay. So, for the concentrated phase, what do we know? We already know that for the concentrated phase, the enthalpy was whatever it is at zero temperature, and then it was plus 12 T squared. We got that by integrating the uh, specific heat. And we know that the entropy of the concentrated phase was 24 times T in the correct unit. That's the molar, entro molar entropy. Okay, and then we also know that for the dilute phase, we wrote down that the entropy and the uh, molar specific heat were equal to 107 times T. So if we combine all of these things, we get HC0 plus 12T squared. This is HC. Uh, minus 24t squared. This is going to be t times the molar entropy must be equal to hd. We don't know. That's what we're trying to find out. Minus t. Well, this would be minus uh, 107 T squared, and this is T S D. Okay, and so what do we have? We have 12 minus 24, so we have minus 12 plus 107, and that comes out to be 95, I think. And so therefore, if we solve for HD, which is the molar enthalpy of the dilute phase, what we end up getting is HC0 is still hanging around, but then we get plus 95T squared, and the units are going to be joules per mole of helium-3. And so that's one important result. And let's just recall, so this is for the dilute phase. We already calculated the molar enthalpy for the concentrated phase. In fact, we just wrote it down up here. It was 12 T squared. And it's gonna be joules per mole. I mean, it's joules of per mole of helium-3, but the concentrated phase is pure helium-3. And so there we go. We have this for the concentrated phase. Okay, way back near the beginning, we wrote down the heat the rate that heat would be extracted from the from the mixing chamber. So cooling power of the mixing chamber, which we call the upside down evaporator. Was Q dot was going to be n dot, the molar rate that we're circulating the helium-3. And it was the final enthalpy, which is the dilute phase, minus the initial enthalpy, which is the concentrated phase. And if we put in these results, for the dilute phase, we had HC0 plus 95T squared. And for the concentrated phase, we had HC0 
plus 12 t squared, but so we're gonna have to subtract off 12 t squared. And this is why I said that it wasn't gonna be important that we know what the molar ent enthalpy is at zero temperature, because these two are gonna cancel. And we're left with Q dot is equal to N dot. Uh, and so 95 minus 12 is about 83. 83 T squared, or writing this a bit nicer, this is 85 N dot T squared. And so this is the cooling power of the mixing chamber of a dilution refrigerator. Um, and so this depends on The circulation rate of helium three, right? That's the n dot, the molar circulation rate. Let me draw that picture one more time that we had, and let me add one thing to it. And so the picture that we had was of our mixing chambers. We had an inlet, and then we had an outlet. And we imagine that somewhere in here was our phase boundary. And so this is helium three in and helium three out. And helium three is crossing our phase boundary. And this is the concentrated phase. And this is the dilute phase which is about 6.6% helium-3. So the one thing that I wanted to add is that we'll see, I think, next time, kind of uh, some pictures or some schematics of like what dilution refrigerators actually look like. And so there's going to be a bunch of stuff that's attached to our mixing chamber, right? It's going to have to be supported by things and there can be heat conducted through those supports. Uh, it also be surrounded by some kind of environment. And if those surrounding environments are at higher temperatures, then they'll be heat radiated into our mixing chamber. Um, if you happen to have any residual gas, you might have heat conducted by that residual gas and all of that is going to result in some heat load, some heat that's absorbed by the mixing chamber per unit time. And so this is our heat load. And so we've now calculated how much heat we could remove and now we're saying that we're going to have some heat load on our mixing chamber. And so this is the heat that we're removing is up here. So this is the rate that heat is removed. And this is the rate that heat is absorbed. And in equilibrium, those two will balance. So in equilibrium, the rate that heat is absorbed is equal to the rate that heat is removed. And so we have this condition that QL dot is going to be equal to this, I think it was 83, right? 83 N dot T squared. So for 
a practical dilution refrigerator. Some numbers might be like the the molar circulation rate of helium-3 is something like 3 times 10 to the minus 5 moles per second. And maybe a typical heat load might be something like half a microwatt. And so then if you calculate your base temperature, that's going to be QL dot divided by 83 N dot and taking a square root. And I think this comes out to be around 14 millikelvin. And so that would be our base temperature. And so it's true that, that that is kind of a typical base temperature for a dilution refrigerator. I think if you have a really optimized system, you might be able to get a slightly below 10 millikelvin, but that's that's a pretty exceptional case. Okay, so that's where I'm going to stop. Thanks very much. What we'll do next time is I think we'll take a look at some of the principles of actually operating a practical refrigerator. Okay, see you then. Thanks.